Hallelujah. Thank you. What a wonderful time of praise. Oh. It is good. It is good to worship the Lord. I see those pictures of Tibet. I think there's people that can't walk down the street and praise the Lord. But they're, they're, they just don't have that right. And we get to praise them outside. Yes. Let everybody know. Hallelujah for that. Hallelujah. Oh, it's good. Um, for those who don't know you, uh, know me. I hope you know you. Um, <laughs> if you don't know you, you'll find out today. Um, my name is Scott Weens. I'm the teaching pastor here at the church. I love to see everybody here. Um, before I get started, I want to talk, uh, tell you real quickly about uh, make an announcement. Uh, something I'm really happy about. Because I've seen this man come a long way. Um, some of you know that we have our, our, metal, uh, our metal men's group. We meet the first and third Sunday nights upstairs in the worship room. Um, and uh, metal stands for men engaged together about life. And it, it is really a truly great uh, time of brotherhood where we get together. In fact, we have everybody recite that uh, what is said here stays here. And... Uh, and that's the pledge we make to our brothers, and we've had some really, uh, really good uh, times of fellowship, and it's only going to get better. Um, but uh, I have asked Dana Lowe to, uh, to lead that group. Uh, Dana has, uh, has exhibited uh, a lot of growth in the last year. God's Amen. really got a hold of him, and it's wonderful to see. And uh, so I'm going to continue to attend, but I don't get to talk as much. All right, you can start clapping now. <laughs> Uh, but uh, so Dana's in fact if for those the men that are on the metal that have been coming regularly uh, You'll start getting emails from Dana and again I hope you all can come and, and support that wonderful men's ministry and it's very per, uh, Appropriate of course for a day like today and Father's Day By the way men is it good to be fathers? Yeah, yes. Yeah, it is. Is it hard to be fathers sometimes? Yes. Yeah, it really is Especially if you have daughters all you guys that just have sons, don't even talk to me. Okay? <laughs> All right, I need a clicker. Someone oh, took my stand, sorry. Okay, that's okay. Your stand is over here. Yep. You know, uh, when he talked about uh, what happened at the Revolution Church and the, the stealing of the sound equipment, we lost some stuff here one time as well. Um, but it truly, do we need all this? No. To, to come together. Do we need all this? We don't even need air conditioning. Okay, now. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Step back. No, but we like it. See, I'm already stepping on toes, aren't I? We really like it. Um, but you know, I think, like we learned, uh, they're probably learning that those things are just things. Those things are just things, especially when you see the pictures we've seen. And Mike, thanks for sharing your heart. I appreciate that. You want to see it. You want to be a genuine person. Uh, if you don't know that guy, you should. Uh, Mike is who he is. He doesn't put on airs, and that's what I love about Mike. I'm really glad to hear that you and your father are kind of reconnected. That's really neat. We've been going through a series. Uh, we just started a few weeks ago in Galatians. We're going through the book of Galatians, and I want you to open up your Bibles if you don't mind. We're in week three, and I've called this, Are You In or Are You Out? That's the name of this. So I want you to turn, if you will, to Galatians chapter 2, and we're going to read the first nine verses, which is the passage text for today. Again, the setting is Paul is writing a letter to the church at Galatia, and uh, he is talking to them, and you are going to see a theme, and uh, Pastor Sean gave an excellent, excellent overview of the book of Galatians, an introduction a couple weeks ago in a great message uh, last week about people pleasing. We had a very active discussion at our life group after that. So we're going to talk and pick up the story in verse 2. And Paul is talking about an event that happened, and he's recounting this in his letter to the church at Galatians. This is what he says, Galatians 2 verse 1, 14 years later, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. 
interesting that he went to Jerusalem not because he was called to Jerusalem, which was really, I guess you could call the headquarters church, right? He didn't go because he was called to go. He went because the Holy Spirit told him to go. He received the revelation. But I um, uh, see before the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I went in response to Revelation, set before them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. But I did this privately to those who seem to be leaders. It's really funny. Paul actually sounds a little ironic in some of what he talks about the leadership here. Almost, it can almost sound like he's being somewhat rebellious. He's not, if you really dig into it, he's not. But it sounds like those who seem to be leaders. Obviously, he's talking to some of them, the men that actually were called to be disciples. They were now the apostles, people who actually walked with Jesus Christ. He said, but I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders for fear that I was running or had run my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. Just so you know, he's writing to the Galatians and he's talking about a problem that was happening in Jerusalem. But don't get mixed up here. This problem was also happening in Galatia. The Jews, of course, had been dispersed to a lot of different places. And the Jews, the Jewish converts to Christianity, were also telling the church at Galatia, hey, if you really want to be a top-notch Christian, you should be circumcised. So he is addressing a problem in the church of Galatia through an experience that he had in Jerusalem with the apostles. This matter arose because, of course, some of the brothers infiltrated our ranks. I looked at the spy on our freedom. Oh, you ever had somebody try to spy on your freedom? That's a really neat metaphor, if you think about it. Yeah. Hmm. That's good. Verse 6, as for those who seem to be important, whatever they were makes no difference to me because God does not judge by external appearance. Those men added nothing to my message. What he's basically saying is, I came in and I told them what I was doing. And I told them the gospel that I was giving, not to get their approval, but simply so we make sure that we're on the same page. And of course they were, because this continues on. He says, on the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task, in verse 7, of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been to the Jews. For God, who was at work in the ministry of Peter as an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Peter, and John, three really key people in the early church. Three key people. Those reputed to be pillars gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. Bow your heads with me. We're going to pray. Yes. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the fact that you have given us grace and you sent your son to give us life. Father, we rejoice in that. And Lord, <laughs> as we expound on this scripture now, as we dig into this, Father, we want to pray that you would... You would Cut us to the quick. Cut us to the quick, Lord. And show us where we might be lacking. We're going to turn our hearts over to you, Father. We're going to turn our hearts over to you, Father. We're going to ask that you give us transparency and courage to face what we might be convicted of through this truth. Pray this in Jesus' name, through whom all truth is given. Amen. Amen. So, what's interesting about this is we look through this. We talked about this was a conference in Jerusalem. And Titus was a Gentile convert. I think it was interesting, by the way, that Paul took two people. One was Barnabas, which, by the way, was his nickname, just so you know. Barnabas was a nickname which meant son of encouragement, okay? His real name was uh, Joshua, I believe. So we have Barnabas, who was a Jewish, con Jewish convert, and we have Titus, who was a Gentile convert. It's almost like Paul said, I'm bringing one of each. <laughs> I'm going to talk to the, the church in Jerusalem about this. 
And what he wanted, of course, was this affirmation from them, just so to make sure they were, they were, they were okay with what he was preaching to the Gentiles. But he was forcing the church to deal with this issue of circumcision. Now, for a lot of us, we, we think of circumcision, we think of it as a medical procedure. But circumcision was actually, it meant a lot to the Jews and still means a lot to the Jews today because it was ordained as a sign when God made the covenant with Abraham. And we're going to flip over to, to uh, Genesis chapter 17 for a moment. And I want to read this quickly because this is the passage of scripture where, where God actually sets this covenant in place. So in 17 verse 9, we start reading, Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. I think he's trying to get a point across. <laughs> he keeps saying, This is my covenant you keep, you and your generations. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Couldn't you choose something else, God? Maybe earrings. <laughs> No, <laughs> every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between you and me. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born to your household or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Now, what is interesting about this covenant is we might say, why circumcision? And there's lots we can say in there, we don't have a lot of time, but just a couple of things. Number one, it was a very symbolic sign because what it, it really referred to was obedience. There, number one, it said there was obedience here. Okay, I don't imagine that Abraham was all too thrilled about becoming circumcised at his age. But it was an act of obedience on a very private part of our body, number one. And number two, there was a symbolization of a cutting off Okay, making God your, your, your God and cutting off all others. Okay, he wanted, this was very symbolic for doing this. And the other one, it really has to do with the fact that, of course, the male seed produces life. Yeah. Produces life. Okay, there was, there was a lot of symbolism in this thing about the circumcision. So you can understand now why the Jews were kind of all wrapped up in this circumcision stuff. Okay, they were really into this. But what happened when Jesus came? See, there was now a new circumcision. It's called a circumcision of the heart. Yeah. And in Colossians, this scripture sums it up very, very well. And this again is Paul writing to who? Well, he's obviously writing to another church and he's addressing the same issue. And look what he says. When you came to Christ in Colossians 2 verses 11, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure, Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. Amen. Amen. A spiritual circumcision, a cutting off of your old sin nature. And with him you were raised to a, everybody say new life. New life. New life. Because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You know, if we read this scripture every day, maybe it would start to sink into us just how significant this is. And the New Testament's full of scriptures like this. We are called to be a new person. There is a circumcision of the heart. In fact, in Ezekiel eleven nineteen, it says this. A lot of you know this. This is a scripture from the Old Testament that talks about what happens inside of our heart. I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. Whose spirit is that? The Holy Spirit comes from God, right? Part of the Trinity. Yeah. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. There's a change that happens inside. Do you remember the day? Do you remember the day when you first believed? Yep. Now, some of us who grew up in a church, I, to me, the day I first believed is kind of muddy. I mean, I remember, you know, baptized and all that stuff, but for me, it, to me, it was a process because I grew up in the church. I grew up in a church. But for a lot of you, you were walking down a path and then God grabbed you and you became convicted and you repented and you turned away from all that and you accepted Christ and something happened that was as real as a physical circumcision. 
something happened inside your heart. There was a change that happened in there. And suddenly, you didn't want any more of that old life. You wanted this life. You wanted to be a, a bond servant to Jesus Christ, not your own master. Amen. Which, of course, if you're trying to be your own master, guess who you're serving, right? Yeah. There was a change that happened. And it was a very sincere, wonderful change. And I think sometimes when we look at that, we think about that new man and we get a little complacent. And we say, yeah, I'm a new man. I got 2 Corinthians 5, 17 memorized. Anybody want to recite it with me? If any man is in Christ, come on, repeat with me. He is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. Yeah, that's me. I got a baptism certificate sticking on my wall. Yet there are times in our Christian walk that our outside and our inside seem to be saying two different things. I'm sure glad you're able to come over and hang out tonight. We're going to have a lot of fun. Man, I wouldn't miss your ribs for the world. <laughs> oh, they are on the grill right now. Smoking, they are going to be so yeah. tasty. They I can't wait. You, you make the best ribs. I'm just, I'm just saying, you make the best stuff. Yeah. Hey, and listen, thanks for picking me up. Car is still in the shop, but I'm going to get it back from Tony tomorrow. I'll have wheels. <laughs> no worries, dude. I know it really stinks not having a ride, but at least I need a ride. I got you. I, got um, you. I appreciate that. Um... You're wearing a Florida Seminoles hat and shirt. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, you are a Gators fan. Love the Gators. They rock. They are awesome. I got to say. Gators are my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess I, I guess I didn't realize you could be both a Gators fan and a Seminoles fan. That's new to me. Dude, I am such a diehard Gators fan. I have my official membership card in my wallet right now. I have it. You got a Gators orange and blue. <laughs> You've got a Gators fan club membership card in your wallet, dude. When my wife converted me years ago, I, I went to the swamp, dove in the mud. Yeah, I went to the game, man. I went to the swamp. I got it, and I got my official membership card. I keep it in my wallet all the time. Um. Did I already mention that? Yeah, yeah, you already mentioned that. Okay. But, right. but you're wearing a Florida Seminoles hat and a Florida Seminoles shirt. Shh, shh, shh. Game is on the radio right now. They're on a 15 yard line, dude. They're getting ready to score. Listen, maybe I can understand you cheering for the Seminoles, but they're playing the Florida Gators right now. <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let, let, let me get this straight. I sh you show up to pick me up. I sit down here. I see you're wearing a Florida Seminoles hat and shirt. You tell me you're a Florida Gators fan. You got the card in your wallet. And yet you're cheering for the Seminoles against your own team. Listen, Jake, just because I'm a diehard Gators fan, I mean, I have the right to choose what I do and what I wear. It doesn't mean that I have to cheer for the Gators all the time. Oh, you're making no sense to me, man. I mean, you're supposed to be a Florida Gators fan and you're cheering for the Seminoles. Yes. Oh. Well, I, I, I can't figure it out. I can't figure it out. I mean, you're coming in here, you're telling me all this stuff. It doesn't make sense. Dude, I already told you. I have the official fan club. It's the official little, <laughs> you know, alligator thing 
in my wallet right <laughs> now. It's in my wallet. It's orange and blue. No. Nope. Yeah, but, but you're wearing the shirt and you're wearing the hat. Shh, shh, shh. They're getting ready to score the extra. kind of interesting about that uh, skit. <laughs> Did you see any, uh, maybe some, uh, some contradiction? He was claiming to be one thing, but his actions told him something, told something totally different, right? I mean, the way he dressed, <laughs> he was cheering for the team that he said was his arch rival, if he was a Florida Gators fan. By the way, if you're a Florida Gators fan and a Seminoles fan, we'll pray for you after, too. <laughs> that's called a divided house in, in your own house, and that's not right. We did the drama because we wanted to, to tell you that, and show to you that, that that's a, a kind of a metaphor of how we are sometimes. How we are inside. And what's interesting is, is when you think about how you are inside, when you think about what happens inside, the natural tendency, of course, should be that whatever is inside should come out, right? Yeah. Right? It should come out. But it doesn't always happen. So let's talk a little bit about this process. And I want to turn to the book of Colossians for the rest of the, the message. Because the book of Colossians has a passage of scripture in here that Paul, I think, really sums it up well. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. I'm going to read this through. Hmm. Now, listen carefully what Paul says. Since, okay, since, then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, your life, appears to you also, uh, then you will also appear with him in glory. Now look at what's in verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. That's the flesh. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk by these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you've been taken, since you have taken off your old self with its practices. Now, what's kind of interesting about this is when you read all this, it's a tendency for Christians to say he's being prescriptive. He's saying that I need to do these things. I gotta put all that stuff off. I gotta do this. But really, Paul isn't being prescriptive. He's being descriptive. Mm -hmm. Now there's a difference. I don't want you to miss this. That's right, amen. The difference here is that he's saying because you have put off your old self, because those things are in the past, you should be doing these things. Those things should not be a part of you anymore. Amen. But there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect. Here's just a little graphic for you. So before Christ, your heart's this heart of stone, as we read in Ezekiel, right? You have the heart of stone. And then you come to that point where you finally realize Jesus is the only answer. And you give your life to him. And now your heart is restored. It's made new. And what happens then is virtue flows out of that. The reason so many churches and so many Christians are called hypocritical is because they get this wrong. They get this wrong. They try, I call it, goose-stepping their way into the kingdom. They try to do things to be righteous, and that's not the way it works. You are made righteous through Christ, and then you begin to fall in line with that. In verse 1 and 2, it says, sets your hearts and your minds. Both actions, by the way, require looking up. If you notice that, you have to look up. Yeah. Hebrews 4.12 says this. The Word of God is alive and active. This is one of those other memory scriptures, right, that we could recite. I'm, I'm preaching this message because I've undergone something recently, and it's a conviction of my own life. 
well, I haven't been living a bad life. I've been doing a lot of good things, helping people out, you know, uh, all that stuff. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I love, I love God and all that stuff. And, and, and so I've been, you could probably take a snapshot of Scott's life and say, oh, that is a good man. He's a good guy. He, he loves God. He gives sermons. Plays in the worship band. But I began to realize something was missing. And what was missing was a passion. It was a fire. And, and I, st I started forcing myself. I was forcing myself to do things. You ever, you ever been through there? You ever got to that point? You find yourself coming to church because you're supposed to. And, and what's interesting is I began to hear this from a couple of other people as well in the body of Christ and in our body. And I began to realize that and it was, I frankly believe it was because I've been reading God's word through the read the Bible in a year that it found, the, the, God's word just began to convict me. It began to convict me that there was something I was restricting and I was limiting. That I had, I, had, I had been pushing something down and pushing it away. In verse 5 it says, put to death. And I think I came to realize I hadn't truly really put everything to death in my life. That there are some things that I really actually held as more important. And I'm not talking about, just so you guys know, I'm not talking about showing up at every event at the church. This has nothing to do with that. This has everything to do with your individual walk with Christ. I began to realize that there was a passion that was missing. And there was something that I needed to add back into my life. This word put to death means to slay with a continuous stroke. You're familiar with the term sanctification, right? In Romans 6, 6, Paul had talks about the fact that our old self was crucified. Okay, he talks about being crucified with him so that the body, uh, the body ruled by sin might be done away with. Okay, but sometimes I think we look at that and, and we think that, okay, I got my membership card. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. It's okay if I watch. R-rated films. It's okay if I cuss every once in a while. It's okay if this, that, because I got my membership card and I'm washing the blood of Jesus. And what happens is we begin to live a mediocrity, a life of mediocrity, a mediocre life. And we don't live it with power because as I've been reading the New Testament, and I've been reading all this stuff Paul's writing about, I'm measuring myself and coming up way short. Way short. Now, you might say, well, Scott, that's really fine for you. I'm glad you're coming up short. I'm okay. Can we get on to the last song? <laughs> well, if that's where you're at, then that's where you're at. Then I might not be, well, I might probably talking to you, but maybe you're not ready to listen. Because the life of power that I read that Paul walked, and I'm not talking about, by the way, just miracles. I'm talking about his focus. The other day I was on a plane. And uh, I'm reading my Bible, getting caught up. I was behind my read the Bible in a year or time. There's a guy sitting next to me. Um, almost went the whole flight. And the Holy Spirit's telling me, you need to talk to him. You need to talk to him. You need to talk to him. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm five days behind. <laughs> you need to talk to him. You need to talk to him. And so finally I talked to him, and then the Holy Spirit did some great things. And I was all excited about that. Oh, wow, God really moved me in something. But I'm like, wow, that happens once a month. Isn't that exciting? You get my point? Yep. Yeah, yeah. That should happen once an hour. It did for Paul. And the same spirit that dwells in Paul dwells in you and I. Yeah. And so what I'm talking about and what I've been convicted about, and I'm going to ask you to... You, I'm not here to give you a guilt trip. I'm here for you to ask God. What are you maybe missing? Where's the power in your life? Is it coming from your own will? Is it coming from your own strength? Or is it coming from God? Because I've been doing, I've been doing a lot of stuff under my own strength. And I'm really tired of it. I'm really tired of it. I put a... I want to put this back up. This was when uh, 
when Pastor Sean gave his first uh, introduction to the Galatians, he talked about the flesh. And one of the one of the ways you can tell if you're living by the flesh is that you are living without dependence on the Holy Spirit. And the way you might be able to tell if you're living independent of the Holy Spirit, meaning you're going to do it yourself, is because you don't feel drawn to Him. Buy a new car, you got to pray. Should be praying. And I'm not talking about recitation prayers. God, please help me make the right decision. Or God, please help uh, so and so who's uh, battling cancer. What are we punching a clock? I don't think Paul punched clocks. I've been punching a clock lately, and I don't want to do that anymore. Amen. Hallelujah. I don't want to do that anymore. We put up, I'm going to use another graphic. I think we put up what's called a stop sign. You guys are all familiar with this phrase in this, from 1 Thessalonians, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Amen. You might say, well, how can you quench the Holy Spirit? We're, just, we're not talking about quenching the Holy Spirit as far as who He is. We're talking about quenching it inside of us. Okay, so... There's your heart. You've been renewed by the Holy Spirit. You're going through the process of sanctification. And then something happens. And we put up the stop sign. Oh, wait a second, God. Everything was fine until you told me to deal with my addiction. Everything was going fine until you told me to love my wife unconditionally. Everything was just fine until you told me that I had to give that up. And now, I'm going to rely on the fact that I got a membership card. And what we're missing is this whole, beautiful, sanctified life that God wanted to use us in, in power. Do you get what I'm saying? you get what I'm saying? Do you want, do you want to be like this? Because I don't. My, my hand's been like this for a while. The cool thing is, you guys haven't been able to see it. <laughs> Some of you closer ones maybe have. I've been going like this. I'm reading the Bible in a year. I'm doing all this stuff. I'm going to stay right here. Thank you very much. And then I just realize it's mediocrity. Yep. And I don't know about you, but did God call us to live a mediocre life? No. Nope. He didn't. He didn't. None of us. He says he uses words like power. What's, what does the power look like in your life? You know, I love being around people who just flow in the spirit. Because you just you just you sit there and you watch and you go, wow, man, that guy's got no reverse. <laughs> just forward. He's just obeying. He's just believing. His stop sign's down. And by the way, it even when you pull it down, it's going to want to come up. And when's it going to want to come up? Is when we're confronted with something and convicted about something that we don't want to have to deal with. In fact, I recently heard a message by a, a longtime minister of the gospel, and he said this. He said, Christians will drown out the call of the Holy Spirit or the conviction of the Holy Spirit because they don't want to hear something that they would then have to be accountable for. That's true. La, 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 la. Oh man, I'm guilty as charged. Guilty as charged. I think sometimes when we look even at the body of believers we have here, I think sometimes we we tend to quench each other sometimes too. We get together and we talk about everything but the Lord. Right. We don't spend time in prayer. Praise God. We, uh, we do events and things, but we don't, you know, that's, and Pastor Sean's starting to lead us towards that direction now with our monthly, our monthly praise worship evening on Wednesdays. God has called us to a life of radical change and growth that requires us to stretch our comfort zones and stop playing it safe. Mm, amen. To yield to the process of sanctification. Yields a tough word, isn't it? Because some of you might be saying, okay, I can't wait till he's done. Because then I can go back to what I'm doing. 
I don't have a lot of power as a, as a preacher and a pastor. I, I don't have a lot of power over your life. I can, I, can, I can give you the truth, and then you have to go and do something about it, but I can't change you. First time I finally figured that out was a great relief, by the way. <laughs> yeah. But it doesn't mean I don't stop <laughs> loving you. And it reminds me of how God, through all my time with my hand being up, he hasn't stopped loving me. There's a lot of things that stop us from listening to the Spirit and moving forward in a life of power. I don't know what yours is. I know what mine is. And that's what I'm going to deal with. I don't know what yours is. But we're going to go into a time of prayer. I'm going to ask the band to come back up. We're going to go into a time of prayer. And, you know, we, 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 when we teach these messages, we give responses. We ask for responses for people to come forward. Um, I'm going to be part of the response today, not because I'm some super spiritual guy that's going to pray for you. I'm going to ask somebody to come pray for me. Um, the response is a real transparent and somewhat um, scary time for people. Because when you get up and you start walking down, people are going to look at you like, I wonder what their problem is. I can guarantee you your problem is no, no bigger or smaller than theirs. Yeah. And what I'm going to ask us for the response is, if you've got something that you, you think, if you've got a stop sign, mm -hmm. and you want God to help you take the stop sign down, then why don't you come up and let's do this together. Why don't you find someone to pray for you? Or why don't you come up and pray for somebody? Just even if you just say, I got a stop sign and I need the courage to take it down. That's all you have to say. You don't have to tell them what your stop sign is. But if it's someone you trust and love, I think confession is good. That's right. And that's what we're going to do. I don't care. Um, God, again, I don't care what your stop sign is. And my prayer is that as a church, we begin to rekindle a moving of the Spirit inside of our lives individually. Yes. Which will then translate to a moving of the Spirit in our church. That's right. Amen. Where great things will happen. I'm not talking about filling up seats. That'll happen. I'm talking about things up here. Amen. Where I'll see you next week or next month and say, you're not the same person. What fell off? <clears throat> Praise God that it did. Yeah. Bow your heads with me when we start. Jesus. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, that you never give up on us. I repent before you, Lord, of the shortcomings that I have, the stop sign that I put up, Lord. I've already talked to you about that. Father, I just want to pray for each one of the hearts right now, those that are saying, I don't know if I'm going to get up. I want to pray, Father, that you, you make this day a, a decision to take the sign down to let you do good things with them. Change lives, Father, change hearts. Rekindle inside of us, Father, the spirit that we have quenched, that we have decided to do it our own way, or we decided that we're only going this far, Lord, and then we're now living the life that's totally yielded 100% to you. 